guests, my fellow participants from the Freedom of Expression Conference. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce right now our keynote speaker of the afternoon, Ms. Kathleen Carroll. Uh, this is a lecture I must say myself I've been looking forward to for a good couple of months now. I remember when we first uh, had con uh, communications, at that moment she said, I think in the second conversation we agreed on the lecture title. Uh, and since then I've been very eager uh, to, to hear actually what she's going to be uh, speaking about. Uh, I'm very sure that we will all be inspired as well as perhaps uh, provoked uh, in, in a positive way by her thoughts as well as her perspectives. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Kathleen Carroll is the executive editor and senior vice president of the Associated Press. As you know, this is the top news uh, in that position that makes her the top news executive, or one of the top executives, of the world's largest independent news agency. She's responsible for news content gathered by some 2,300 staffers, working in more than 100 countries, and distributed across all formats to worldwide audience. Since 2004, she has led the Associated Press through a major global restructuring so that 10 regional editing hubs around the globe now speed delivery of news once largely channeled from the New York headquarters. She has driven to give AP coverage for new sophistication while meeting the evolving demands and capabilities of today's multimedia formats. In addition, she has been a leader in decision making about vital security issues for journalists covering stories in war zones and other hostile environments and on challenges to journalistic access. She has led AP's global focus on journalism that holds government officials accountable to the people they lead. Before becoming AP's executive editor, in 2002, she was an editor and news executive of the Knight Ritter Washington Bureau and the AP in Washington, California, New Jersey, and her native uh, state of Texas. She's also worked in the International Herald Tribune, the San Jose Mercury News, and the Dallas Morning News. She is on the board of the Committee to Protect Journalists, Associated Press Managing Editors, and has also served on the Pulitzer Prize Board since 2003, of which she is co-chair in 2012. The lecture title, as I said, that I've been looking forward to for a few months now, it's none of your business. The challenges of getting public information to the public. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in a very, very warm welcome for Ms. Kathleen Kara. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am not uh, PowerPointing today, so you're just going to have to look at me or the slide or pretend to keep your eyes open as we go, because I know it's the late afternoon. So why do governments keep so many secrets? They all do, of course. Kingdoms or dictators or democracies of every kind, single party, multi-party. It really doesn't matter what kind of system governs a nation. That system values and keeps a lot of secrets. So let's start by conceding that there are some activities, diplomatic negotiations, military strategies, that should remain secret at least for a while. But that's really a small part of what governments do. The vast majority of government work should be out in the open and available to the citizens that those governments serve. And there are more than 100 countries around the globe that agree with what I just said. Those nations have no laws that acknowledge that their citizens have the right to know what's being done on their behalf. By the book, that means there are more than 5 billion people around the world who are free to ask questions of their government and expect clear and speedy answers. In reality, nearly half of those countries simply ignore their own laws. Citizens who seek information are ignored, or in the worst cases, punished just for asking. So last year, AP journalists decided to conduct the first ever test of those transparency laws around the world. We asked the same two questions of the European Union and 105 nations that have open records laws. And about half the nations that mandate public disclosure had this answer for us. It's none of your business. So what were these intriguing questions that we ask? They were really simple. How many people have been arrested on terrorism charges since the September 11, 2001 terrorism attacks in the United States? And how many of those people have been convicted? 66 of those countries gave us an answer, some kind of answer, most of not complete. But even with those paltry responses, we could document that there was a dramatic surge in terrorism arrests since 2001. 
nearly 120,000 arrests in those countries and more than 35,000 convictions. The actual amount is almost certainly higher since we only got paltry, the technical term is actually half-assed, but responses <laughs> to our requests. One third of those 35,000 convictions, nearly 13,000 came from just two countries, Turkey and China. They are among the countries that human rights advocates complain use terrorism laws to crack down on dissenters. So what do we mean by terrorism? How do those countries define it? Well, it really depends. In China, for example, there were more than 7,000 arrests under a definition that counts terrorism as one of the three evils, cap T, cap E, along with separatism and extremism. So that's a little bit about what we found. Let's talk about how easy it was to get these numbers, how easy it was to use the laws these countries have on the books. Of the 105 countries that we asked the questions of, only 14 actually answered in full and within the deadline that their law requires. Among them, India, Armenia, and the Cook Islands. <laughs> Another 38 countries answered most of the questions, provided some data, but they were days or weeks or even months late. That includes the United Kingdom, France, Germany, which was five months late, Canada, and the United States, which was hideously late and provided almost useless information. Belgium and Austria were among those who simply didn't respond at all. In fact, more than half of the countries didn't release a thing, and a third didn't even acknowledge that we had asked them anything. Among those who didn't respond were Pakistan and China. Those were countries that, opened that instituted information laws in part because there were financial incentives, not because there was a huge public outcry for transparency. In China, it was a condition for joining the World Trade Organization. In Pakistan, it was in return for one and a half billion dollars in loans from the International Monetary Fund. So let's pause for a minute and keep two things in mind. Since I've been describing a journalistic exercise, Let's remember that these laws are not on the books to serve journalists. They're on the books to serve citizens. And even if a national government is responsive to requests, regional and local officials may not have yet gotten on board with the transparency message. In China, for example, one family in an industrial northeastern city tried to use the laws to flesh out why local authorities were steamrolling a construction project that threatened the family home. They got the records, they proved the process was deeply flawed and probably shouldn't have gone forward, and the house was raised anyway. There are places, however, where the system does work, and India is one of them. India's information law passed in 2006, and since then, citizen requests have exploded from 24,000 in the first year to more than a million a year today. Politicians there describe information as a fundamental human right, a fundamental human right. And there are dozens of blogs that help people with the right to information issues. Many of those requests from citizens have uncovered local corruption and unethical behavior just as the information laws were intended to. But there are still some issues. There are cases in which local officials who are su suspected of corruption simply refuse to answer the questions, or in the worst cases, go after the asker instead. Another model law is Mexico's. Re requests can be anonymous. All the responses are made public, usually within a month. The government processes more than 3,000 requests a week and answers incomplete, completely, 85% of them. That's a really good record, for those of you who aren't familiar with this. The U.S. gets about 600,000 requests a year, more than Mexico, but fewer than in, in India. And a large number of those requests are filed by people researching their family histories, seeking military records of their ancestors, for example. 
There are also a number of online resources, government and private, to help make that easier for them. And indeed, the internet has made transparency easier in many cases. Mexico's law, for example, went into effect during the internet era, only in 2003. And filing the request and getting the answers is quite easy. The law in the United States, on the other hand, went into effect in the paper-pushing era of 1966. I don't want to know how many people in this room weren't born in 1966. And since the 46 years since then, a Byzantine bureaucracy has grown up. Each separate federal agency has its own office to handle requests, meaning citizens have to know how the system works and where to ask before they ever begin to file a request. And if the request is denied, heaven help you if you have to file an appeal. Only half of the requests get a full answer, though rarely within the 20 days that the law requires. And requests can linger for years, and there's no consequence for not answering. For example, more than 10 years ago, the AP asked the State Department for information about a now defunct Greek terrorist group. 10 years later, we still had no answer. The group is dead. We checked on it anyway late last year, and a staffer said, that information has been sent to a senior reviewer. <laughs> the US system clearly needs some updating, and the Obama administration has gotten a start. It set up an office to streamline things, and that's having some good effect. And one of Obama's first acts as president was to change the presumption about the federal law to one of disclosure. In other words, all questions about what was going on were expected to yield an answer. That was not the case prior to his taking office. Yet, the Obama administration is also the one that has stepped up the investigation and prosecution of government whistleblowers, employees who've exposed waste or fraud in their agencies. Obama's not the only politician to have a mixed view of transparency. Prime Minister Tony Blair pushed for a public information law in 2005, and now Britain has a thriving one. But today, Blair refu refers to his support of transparency as monumentally stupid, saying in his autobiography, I quake at the imbecility of it. Like many officials, Blair's views on the need for open government changed after he began, well, governing. <laughs> His view these days is that officials can't be effective if there is even a chance that the public might learn about their deliberations. Heaven forfend. The public, it seems, must be protected from the ugly business of government done on their behalf. <laughs> Philippine President Benigno Aquino III was similarly worried about the downsides of transparency, and he's only recently decided to support a proposed freedom of information law in that country which is one of about two dozen considering um, laws in addition to the 105 already on the books. So what exactly are we being protected from? What is so bad about secrets? Let's just turn that question on its head. What's so bad about transparency? Why not tell your citizens what you are doing for them? Let's take public safety. A fundamental function of any government and a topic of keen interest to most citizens. It's certainly a topic of intense conversation in Japan, where I just was this week, and where last March a tremendous tsunami damaged and ultimately melted the reactors, the nuclear reactors, at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. You may have read about it. The situation was terribly frightening. Tens of millions of Japanese citizens were worried about radiation in their food and in their air, and they were simply not getting straight answers from their government. Documents obtained through the Japan's open record laws shows that both the government and plant operators were well aware of the risks to this plant of a tsunami far before the March 11th tsunami, but they were in no hurry to deal, about it, deal with it. In fact, they agreed four days before the tsunami hit to have a lengthy study of the issue. A different set of documents from the US nuclear regulatory officials who were talking with their counterparts in Japan during the crisis spells out just how confused the situation was in Detroit, in Detroit, in Tokyo, and Washington's deep mistrust of assurances about what was happening at the plant. Now, what is the value of keeping any of those things secret? 
And what is the value of knowing these things today? In New York City, the topic of public safety is utterly intertwined, safety is utterly intertwined with the September 11th terrorist attacks. City officials who no longer trusted the FBI, the CIA, or other federal agencies to protect their city set up their own anti-terrorism unit. And it has since become one of the most aggressive intelligence gathering agencies in the entire United States. The unit was set up with CIA help and lots of money from Washington. And it's been secretly spying on Muslim citizens by infiltrating their mosques, their coffee shops, their businesses, and their student organizations. And not just in New York City, but in neighboring states and on university campuses throughout the Northeastern United States. Almost always, this surveillance took place without the consent or even the knowledge of local officials. And all of that activity, everything that I just described to you, was a secret until we revealed it in a series of stories beginning last summer. At first, the New York City Police Department denied that the unit even existed. And the city council that governs the city didn't know about it either. Local Muslim groups have complained about citizens being targeted simply because of their faith. And officials at some of the universities and neighboring cities penetrated by the New York agents are none too happy either. Now it's true that this kind of police activity is common in many countries around the world, but in the United States, one of the long enshrined values protects citizens from police investigation unless authorities have a legitimate reason to suspect illegal activity. Now New York City's mayor and police chief say that this unit is acting legally and they strongly defend its activities as vital to protecting the city against terrorists. They also imply that critics are not sufficiently worried about the next attack. Two of the city's newspapers not only agree, they howl that the AP's reporting may actually put the city at greater risk, that unveiling, unveiling these secrets may put New York's citizens in danger. Now both those views, strongly held and certainly tartly worded, in my view miss the point. Taxpayers payers fund this unit, and the unit was formed to protect these taxpayers. And yet the entire effort was not just secret. The NYPD even denied that it existed until we could prove to them that we knew it did. Now you can have a healthy discussion about whether or not this kind of intelligence gathering is ultimately helpful or harmful. And you can debate the merits of targeting a group of people because heinous acts have been committed by others in the name of their shared religion. But you can only have those discussions if you know about the unit in the first place. And if the government funded activity is in fact no longer a secret. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Carroll. And uh, I'd be now very happy to take questions and comments from all of you. Um, Ms. Carroll, thanks a lot for being here, for being so courageous. Um, it is, it's not something new for me because I have been doing research on the media in the US and freedom of expression and everything. And actually, um, a country that has made freedom of expression so popular all over the world, where even Chinese people are trying to leave China to go to the US because of freedom of expression. It is with great <laughs> sorrow <laughs> that I hear you saying all these things. But one of the things that I hope all the people here present, because we are not too many, we are talking about human rights, and I wish there were more people interested to listen. So I think, and I hope you think with me, and you, I hope you help me wherever you are, wherever you go, which kind of profession you have, if you are a lawyer or a journalist, please help me to define what human rights are. Help me to ask these people, perhaps we need to redefine what are human rights. And 
perhaps we should write another charter of human rights and send to these people to the, in the US, uh, in Europe, wherever they are, because we really need a redefinition of which are human rights. I don't think, you know, it sounds like as if you are in a science, science fiction film, <laughs> because if we look at uh, all the things that the US is telling the world about human rights, it's kind of a contradiction. So that's actually not a question to you, it's a comment, and I hope the public here will echo. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I, I might just add that I think what we're talking about here is human nature um, as much as anything else. That, uh, you know, not disagreeing with you at all, but I think that what we're, what we're seeing is despite a, a, a whatever motivates a government to, to put laws into effect that, that advocate transparency and information on behalf of their people. It's very hard to get past bureaucratic inertia and uh, the fact that most of us don't like somebody looking over our shoulder when we're doing our jobs. And uh, that is the sort of base human um, instinct that, that causes the kind of behavior that I was describing. I'm Gavin Phillips, and I'm a law professor from, from England. Um, thanks. I, I was pleased you brought up the example of, of Tony Blair. Uh, obviously, one of his actually, his actually more imbecilic comments was uh, <laughs> leaving office. And one, <clears throat> one reason may have been that the Freedom of Information Act that you referred to in the UK was actually used to request the minutes of the cabinet meeting <laughs> in, in the run-up to the Iraq war. And in fact, for the first time, then a ministerial veto was used to override the d decision of the information commissioner that those should be released. And that may have been one of the things that he had in mind. Absolutely, you're right. I mean, the UK it was great that that was introduced because the UK used to be the world leader in democracies for secrecy. Because under a 1911 Official Secrets Act, it was a crime to reveal any piece of official information, um, which was a particularly glorious statute that we used to have on the books. Um, the other thing was, I was pleased you mentioned you sort of tied the issue of openness with with the kind of issues around the war on terror. Because I think one of the big kickbacks that's happened since 9/11 has been governments trying to sort of actually strengthen secrecy and going against um, the kind of trend before that to transparency. I mean, one current issue with, with Obama actually is drone strikes, mm -hmm. where it's not widely known that they've been enormously increased under Obama, but the administration steadfastly refuses to reveal any information about them, though some very brave journalists are trying to find it out on the ground. Mm -hmm. And in the UK, it's, <coughs> it's come about through um, discovering what happened to British citizens in Guantanamo Bay and, and also uh, uncovering British um, complicity in torture both in relation there and with other countries where it's, it's been incredibly hard to get information but some brave people have actually managed to do it and gradually that story is beginning to unravel. But it seems to me that, that, that strengthening rights to know and the activities of investigative journalists have been one of the, the best ways of fighting back against what happened to us in the war on terror. Thank well, you. I, I completely agree with you about, uh, uh, about the spreading the blanket of, or the, of potential terrorism as an excuse for not complying with laws or uh, doing something inconvenient. That has been, at, at the AP, we're very active filers of freedom of information requests. At every level of government, we file more than a thousand a year um, across the United States and uh, another, you know, a couple of hundred outside the United States. And, you know, these laws only work when they're used. It's like muscles for those of us who don't like to exercise, you know. And uh, um, uh, that uh, you have to not only know the law better than the officials that you're asking uh, for information from, but you have to know how to appeal and you have to be uh, as tenacious as, as all get out uh, in the face of incredibly bogus excuses that come your way in the form of a rejection. Um, so, uh, yes, and uh, uh, it's, so I agree with you about uh, uh, also the, uh, the need to continue to, to work these laws in order for them to stay viable. Henry Mulek, CBS News, New York, and uh, past president of the Associated Press Television right. Radio Association for California, Nevada. So I'm a big excellent. fan, huge resource, 100 countries, you have to have resources on the ground to right. be able to do that. Right. Tell us a little bit about the process in the native languages with people there in yep. the capitals, that kind of thing? Yeah, we, um, we have people in all those countries and, uh, and they, in fact, uh, we got boned up on, uh, on what the law was and they all, uh, they're all speakers of and readers of um, the languages and we filed. Sometimes it took filing, you know, it was online, sometimes it took um, uh, certified letters 
in China, we call, I keep picking on China, but they, uh, uh, we called uh, to find out, uh, called the office to find out how to file one, and they told us to fax a freedom of information request to the office to find out how to file a freedom of information request, and of course, no answer ever came. Um, what we uh, did that I really like that sort of goes back to, to your comment was we put on the web every document that we got. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents. We also did a big map that described, a global map that described each country and how long it took for them to comply, how late they were if they were late, whether it was a complete re reply, an incomplete reply, if there was nothing. And um, you also, we also put on there uh, in people's languages, in the, in the appropriate language, how to file. So we taught citizens how to file. And we had a Facebook page that asked people what they wanted us to look for next. It's been an incredible um, experience just to see how uh, keenly citizens want to get engaged in their government in this way. There's no other kind of organization in the world that would be able to do that, is there? Well, I think there are probably others that could. Um, I'm glad we did. Renate Schröder from the European International Federation of Journalists. Thanks very much for contribution. I thought it was excellent. Yeah. I just want to add something from the European level, as I am working and living in Brussels. Actually, you may know there is an access to document um, directive, which has been a big step forward regarding transparency. At the moment, we are in a revision process, mm -hmm. and um, while the Parliament is very much for improving the access to documents directive, we hear from the Council of Ministers that the major member states, including UK, Germany, France, Italy, Poland, you name them all, they want to water down the directive. They want to water down the definition of documents. They want to get a much stronger waiter right by member states. So. It's not a real surprise. I think you also mentioned the war against terror. The, the, w the wind blows a bit from there. Mm. The problem we face is the, our federation from a principle, we are lobbying against it, but unfortunately many, many journalists, especially in Brussels, they're very happy to have their little leakages. They have their relations and their ways to get to information. And sometimes it's difficult to campaign together with them. So here I'm talking critical about my own members. Thank you. So you spoke about how Obama came into the presidency with this banner of transparency, and you also spoke about how that's been a mixed message. Do your research over the past four years of filing public records requests show that um, the Obama administration has been more responsive or equally responsive as previous administrations? And that said, with these limitations on the uh, FOIAs, how is it possible for citizens or agencies to get the government to strengthen these laws when legislators are often opposed to public records laws and in fact oftentimes will exclude the legislature itself from being under the umbrella of yep. public records laws. Yep. Well that's a big hairball of a question. Um, uh, we uh, measure about every year there's, a, there's an event in the United States every March called Sunshine Week that and uh, news organizations uh, do projects about public access. And for the last several years, we've measured how the Obama administration has done. It really depends on the agency. Um, uh, you know, the EPA has gotten, the Environmental Protection Agency is the one that uh, governs uh, uh, quality of air and water and so on. And they, they have become quite a bit better at responding and, and in fact, provide information to, to people who want to know about particular pollution in their specific neighborhood. The Justice Department, on the other hand, uh, um, it's always a challenge. Um, uh, the, the administration <laughs> set up in the early days of the Obama administration, they set up this office that I mentioned that's supposed to make everything smoother, uh, and it has worked. But of course, when we uh, filed a request for the minutes of the meeting that set that up, we were told those were closed. <laughs> so, so um, uh, yeah, it's with as many branches of government and as many uh, forms of government as there are in a country as large as the United States, you have a variety of people interpreting what the rules can mean and finding ways to exempt themselves. And the only way to stay ahead of it is to know more about it than they than they do, and to keep uh, keep pushing. 
and you know, look, we, we make this a journalist issue and it's not. And the reason I talked about this as a citizen's issue is because it is a citizen's issue. These laws weren't created for journalists. They were created for citizens. And we need to keep talk when we talk about this, we need to talk about this uh, on behalf of the people who want to find out what their you know, grandfather's military record was or whatever it is, that, or find out what's going on in their town. We need to help them learn how to do that. And, uh, and I regret when journalists oppose things that, that help citizens because they're the people we're supposed to also be serving. So now I'm get off my little soapbox. Joe Matthewson from Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any country that imposes sanctions or penalties for non-answers or uh, uh, untimely answers, late answers? There may be, and I just don't know the database well enough to be able to answer that precisely. There are, there are, in some places that I know of, penalties, and they are ignored just like the law is. But um, I, I tell you what, I'll, I'll meet you afterwards and give you the link to the database, and you can look. Wilhelmin Groot from Radio Netherlands. I was wondering, when it comes to citizens, is there, um, um, do citizens have an equal right uh, to get the information they want. For example, when you talk about India or Mexico, um, it sometimes and most likely always, it matters who you know and who you are, whether you have access to government, uh, governmental institutions. I'm not sure that's right. In, in Mexico, the, uh, the, the requests are made through an online, you, you, you make the request through a data, uh, an online site and the request can be anonymous. So you don't have to work the machinery to make it work. So I'm not sure I agree with your, your supposition there. In India, um, the requests are not necessarily anonymous, but the, there's such a cottage industry of people who are navigate, helping you navigate the system that um, even if that is, a ca is the case every now and then, I think the bulwark of the activity is toward um, Average people getting an answer of some kind. No. Okay. Other questions or comments? Could I just ask about? Um, do you think that freedom of information legislation is enough? Um, going, going on the example which you've been using, well, and in my own country, a bit of a follow-up to what Gavin was saying. I mean, in Britain, the coalition government, I believe, is now thinking of actually watering down the legislation. Mm. You know, amending it backwards rather than rather than improving it. Well, improving it from their point of view in the sense, right. of course, they will have to give up even less information than they would be willing to do. Is it enough or should there be other instruments for, for ensuring accountability? If you have no law, then you have no, no options. So yeah. it's at least a baseline. Uh, clearly, um, uh, having it is not, alone is not enough since half of them felt, you know, all they needed to do was say, you know. The hell with you, you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, but 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 having no law is is of, of no use whatsoever. Uh, and you know, I don't know what it is that 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 motivates people to push their lawmakers for this. Clearly, it has. Uh, you know, what is it that has that has persuaded um, public officials in India to see the right to information as a fundamental human right? I mean, I think that that's where uh, that's where this has to go, because otherwise, it's always going to be about. I don't really want anybody. Chief, if anybody really heard what I said at that meeting, I might be embarrassed. You know. Judy Miller from USC Annenberg School. Um, I, I'm curious when you said this is for, obviously it's for the citizens, and you say you had good response on your website when you asked people. What would you like us to ask on your behalf and all of that? But I'm, I'm, I mean, there's probably no way to quantify this, but you're feeling for general awareness, at least in the American population, for what sunshine laws are meant to do. And in, to extend that, for instance, what they've given up in, under laws like the Patriot Act, which nobody seems to have read, including the people who voted for it. Um, I'm just curious if why there's not more outrage when people go into private session uh, and why there's not more outrage when the Patriot Act keeps getting passed over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the United States, I think, it's back to what I said earlier, we've made this a journalist issue, and journalists are not always the most popular people on the block. And, uh, you know, oftentimes when I talk to, when you talk to average people about it, 
they think you want to see their divorce records. <laughs> or, you know, some rec they think they don't see this as something that they can use. They see this as something that, that can be intrusive for them. That's why it, in, in the U.S., which is a country that's full of immigrants and people who don't understand their history, genealogy is a huge, huge, huge um, pastime and hobby now. And genealogy actually gives us you know, an avenue into citizens who want to um, use these laws on their behalf to get what to anybody else is benign information. And it takes it into a realm that is more easily understood. But it's shocking the number of times when I'm talking with citizen groups and they feel that this is uh, you know, nosy journalists wanting to mess around in their business, and they don't see it as a way for them, for them, to understand what their governments are doing. So, anyway, you've all been a great audience. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time and attention. Thank you. So Ms. Ms. Miller, we really, really appreciate you taking the time out of a very busy schedule to travel all the way to Berlin to be with us.